My name is Fred Siegel. I'm the scholar in residence at St. Francis, and I put on a series of forums over the course of the year. We just had one on the question of does France have a future after the recent events at Charlie Hebdo. Uh, we had a forum on France, and in a few weeks we're going to have one on uh, policing in New York. Uh, how successful has it been? Does it need to be modified? So let me, let me thank you all for being here. And let me introduce uh, Pete Leibman. Uh, Pete will be the moderator uh, for, for tonight's discussion. Um, Pete is a former school principal. When, when Pete talks about education, he knows what he's talking about because he's seen it from all angles. He's a former school principal. He's been at St. Francis College for the last eight years. Um, he has, with, thanks to Pete, St. Francis has partnerships with 25 different schools. And uh, we've had great, we, St. Francis, has, have, has had great success in placing our students in teaching positions. Um, so without further ado, let me, let me turn things over to Pete. First of all, I'd like to thank my brother-in-law, Fred Siegel, for those unsolicited comments. Thank you, Fred. Um, I have to tell you that we've had a lot of success here in the Education Department at St. Francis. The reason being that we have such a great group of, uh, of professors, some of whom are, are here tonight. Um, I'd like to introduce Deborah Reeks Rogers. Dr. Rogers, would you stand, please? <clears throat> Dr. Marina Gare. Dr. Marissa Cohen from our Psychology Department. I would also like to thank Fred. Um, he, as he said, he's our scholar in residence, and uh, he's brought to us uh, a number of timely events, provocative events, and this hopefully will be one of them. The reason I'm sitting in between our two presenters is so it doesn't get out of hand. Fred is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, noted author, and a great friend of St. Francis College. Okay. Uh, a few things. It's true that we do have about 25 partnership schools. What does that mean? Well, first of all, the partnership schools uh, accept our students, they host our student teachers, and hopefully, if they like what they see, they'll hire our students. One of our best partnerships is uh, Booty Junior High School on Avenue S. They've hired 22 of our students in the last four years. The faculty only has about 70 teachers, so rapidly we're taking over that school. Part of a partnership is that it's a two-way street, and what has to happen is we both have to do our part. So invariably what happens is I'll be asked to speak at one of the schools to the PTA or the faculty. The question that always comes up is, hey, what's the story with Common Core? Is this a plus or a minus for our schools? Why did we go to Common Core? And a host of other questions. Hopefully, all of those questions will be answered tonight. I'd like to first introduce our two speakers. First, Kathleen Porter McGee. She began her career as a classroom teacher at the middle and high school levels. Um, she served as senior advisor at the college board, director of curriculum and director of teacher principal development and recruitment for the Diocese of Washington, D.C. Presently, she is superintendent and chief academic officer at the Partnership for Inner City Education and a fellow at the Thomas B. Fordham Institute. Professor Kathleen Porter McGee. <clears throat> I had asked Kathleen earlier how she possibly could have uh, accomplished so much. She's so young. So all of our student teachers here, I want you to look at her as, a, as an outstanding role model. Our next presenter is Dr. Peter Wyatt Wood, former provost at King's College, anthropologist and award-winning author. His books examine the emergent themes in modern American culture. He was appointed president of the National Association of Scholars in 2009. Dr. Peter Wyatt Wood. Okay, our format for tonight. Um, Kathleen will begin with a 15-minute presentation 
on why she believes Common Core is a good idea. That will be followed by 15 minutes by Dr. Wood. Then he will offer a rebuttal of 10 minutes. She will offer a rebuttal of 10 minutes. And then we're going to open it up for questions. So without any further ado, Kathleen. So I, I had the pl pleasure and the privilege of working for Fordham twice, and I've led their standards reviews both times that I've worked there, which means that um, uh, I'm probably one of the few people that had the blessing, or as you might say, the curse of having read every state's standards for English, math, science, and social studies more than once and long before the Common Core came out. Um, I'm also a mom. I have three young kids who are just beginning their K-12 education career, and I, um, I really hope that their education is guided by the framework that we, we've now come to know as the Common Core. Uh, I really am honored to be with you here this, this evening. I have watched and I have participated in the Common Core debate for the past five years, and I have watched as it's gone from kind of a sleepy side issue to really a national firestorm. And throughout that time, um, I've been unwavering in my support for standards-based reform in general and for the Common Core in particular. Um, and tonight that I can confidently say that no matter what hat I'm wearing, whether it's as a policy expert, whether it's as an educator, whether it's as a mom, um, that I, I remain steadfast. And, and tonight, I hope to share the reasons why. To that end, I think it's actually important to start thinking about why we have academic standards to begin with. Uh, any conversation about Common Core doesn't exist in a vacuum. Uh, it comes on the heels of, of several decades, actually, of standards-driven reform. So I wanted to start there. Um, for, new, for nearly two deca decades, states have been setting um, standards, expectations of student learning, academic expectations, for either individual grade levels or grade bands in each of the core content areas. And the idea, they're meant to ensure that all students, regardless of race, socioeconomic status, or zip code, are held to the same rigorous expectations. And there's actually ample evidence that without clear objectives or without clear expectations, teachers will often unconsciously raise or lower their expectations based on the perceived abilities of students in their classrooms, so the students in front of them, rather than based on what students need to learn um, that grade level or learn to be prepared for the future. And just as one example, a study that was published in 2012 actually found, so what they did was they pulled together student work and they took all of the um, identifying information and they gave it to teachers. Um, and the only information they told the teachers was that um, the feedback they were writing on the, on the work would go directly to the student. And then they told the, the teachers that either the student was, was um, Latino, they were black, or they were white. And what they found was something called a positive feedback bias. So in other words, um, the teachers were much tougher on the, on the white students in their feedback than on the black or Latino students. Um, and they, they just simply expected more from the white students, even though they knew nothing other than the student's race and that the students would be getting that feedback. And of course, it goes without saying that these biases are almost certainly unintentional, but that doesn't make them any less real for the students that we serve. And that is no doubt why many minority students who graduate at the top of their classes from high school can often report feeling a culture shock when they go into colleges and universities, specifically elite colleges and universities. Um, and I read an interesting piece by uh, one such student, a, a gentleman named Daryl Robinson, um, who penned a piece for the Washington Post uh, a year or two ago, I believe. And he explained, he went to Georgetown, and he explained, even though I attended some of the districts, the Washington, D.C., the district's better schools, the gap between what I can do and what my college classmates are capable of is enormous. And in the same article, Robinson actually discussed the first time he ever felt really pushed to his limits in class, and it was actually when he forced his way into an advanced placement course in high school. And he said suddenly the expectations for what he needed to do to succeed were far higher than anything he had ever done before. Um, and it's interesting to think about that. What is the difference? Robinson was obviously seen throughout his career as an exceptional student. He clearly had the aptitude and the drive necessary to achieve at high levels. So why did it take until late high school to really be pushed to his limits and really to be pushed to, to think beyond uh, the basics? And there are no doubt, I don't want to oversimplify, there are no doubt many, many different explanations for this. But it's hard for me to ignore that in advanced placement classes, 
There are rigorous standards, there are quality curricular materials, and there are also assessments to which all students, regardless of what, where they come from, who they are, what their race or socioeconomic status are, they, they will be held to the same expectations. And that kind of clarity makes it difficult to allow prior biases, whatever they are, delivered or subconscious, to subtly lower the students, uh, to, let, to subtly lower the standards for the students who are sitting in front of you. That said, let me be clear. Standards alone are no silver bullet, and we all know that. Um, they are necessary, but they are insufficient. But I do believe that they've gone a long way to ensuring that our most disadvantaged students are held to the same expectations as their white, more affluent peers. And in fact, over the past several decades of standards-based reform, it is our most disadvantaged students who have benefited from the standards-driven reform movements. The gold standard for, for measuring student achievement is the, the National Assessment for Education Progress, or the NAEP. And since 1971, scores for white students are up just four points, but scores for Latino students are up 21 points, and for black students, they're up 30 points, again, within the Sanders era. If that helps explain sort of the rationale for why I think standards are so important, it doesn't yet talk about why the Common Core in particular. So I want to take a few minutes just to talk about that. Um, so in short, while states have set standards for student learning now for about two decades, a little bit more than that in some states, for, grade, grade, um, for each grade or for grade bands, the variability of those state standards, um, they varied wildly from state to state. Some set standards that were very, very rigorous, that were very clear, that were very teachable. Other states had set standards that were very generic or very vague. And so students were still being held to very different standards. Um, and the, 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 in, in far too many states, the bar was set far too low, leaving a real gap between classrooms and schools and not helping us ensure that all students are held to the same expectation. Again, is the Common Core the right to solution to that problem? I think in order to answer that question, I would focus on four facts. So the first one is that the, state sta the Common Core are clear, they're rigorous, they're nationally and internationally benchmarked. So the second is that the Common Core English standards, they emphasize the importance of reading rigorous, high quality literature in English class, plus reading nonfiction and history, science, and other courses, with again, the focus being on the rigor of the content that they're reading, excuse me, of the, of the text they're reading. Third, the Common Core math standards prioritize the most important math content at each grade level, including a heavy dose of math facts and arithmetic in early grades. And fourth, by adopting the Common Core, states benefit, many states benefit from much stronger standards, but they still do retain full control over curriculum, instruction, and pedagogy, and they keep that where it belongs at the local level. 15 minutes is a short amount of time to cover a lot of territory, so I'm going to deliberately leave some things out. Um, two years ago, uh, Kathleen and Saul Stern, my debating partner from last fall, published an article on National Review Online with the um, uh, interesting title, Why Are Prominent Conservat Conservatives Criticizing a Set of Rigorous Educational Standards? So I'd like to answer that question. Um, we're, we conservatives, I consider myself one, uh, are criticizing the Common Core broadly on three grounds, its purpose, uh, its substance, and the process by which it has come into being. I'm not going to give those equal amounts of attention, but let me run through all three. The purpose of the Common Core is to substitute utilitarianism for education. It replaces the idea that students need to be brought to a full understanding that includes character, imagination, the capacity to think broadly and informed about many things, with the idea that the purpose of education is to make them, in Common Core's own language, college and career ready. The kinds of college and career readiness that the Common Core puts forward involves pretty much a calculation of a set of skills that students need to thrive in the college classroom and ultimately in the workplace. Now, this utilitarian spirit is written clear through the, the standards, but it comes clear, I think, in the way in which the Common Core uh, attempts to bridge contradictions. That's almost a, a hallmark of utilitarianism. So the Common Core promises to introduce students to 21st century skills. On the other hand, it promises that it's going to focus on 
uh, heightened attention to arithmetic. Um, the liberation of uh, students from the stifling strictures, and again, quoting some Common Core material, uh, gets matched with the promise that there are going to be an ever more rigorous, and Kathleen is emphasizing the word rigorous, set of standards and tests that come with this. There is a element in the Common Core that promises that this is a mere technocratic exercise, it's apolitical, it has no purposes beyond that, and yet it promises to transform American education. Now, those sorts of things may not instantly look like contradictions, but if you think through them, you can't really have one without the other. If you're going to transform American society with this set of standards, they're anything but apolitical. There is, in the Common Core, a promise for transparency. It's coupled with utter obscurity. Now, I think more of that will come out when I turn to the issue of process, but let me make a quick stab at the issue of the substance of the Common Core. It's hard to run through hundreds of standards. I'm not going to try to do that. Let me point out to some general themes. The Common Core values complication for complication's sake. Anyone who's taken a stab at the way math is now taught in the primary grades can quickly get this point. That is, simple algorithms are replaced by bizarrely complex procedures. The consequence of that is to shut students away from their parents. This is a generational gap that is being engineered into education by the Common Core. That is, parents can't help their students with math homework, for sure. The breaking of generational links is a dire social consequence of the Common Core, one that could easily have been foreseen, but wasn't, and that takes us to the process issue, which I'll defer for a moment. There is in the Common Core a profound misunderstanding of the mind of the child who becomes a, a, a receptacle of this utilitarian philosophy with no understanding at all that a child's mind works differently from that of an adult. There is the deprecation of the power of memory. That is, one of the things that children learn, learn really well is things that they can memorize. But memory has now become pedagogically suspect at best. It's usually treated as worse than that. So we have the evaluate the overvaluation of abstraction, the idea that students should be taught math theory at the earliest age because that will lead them to a better comprehension of math skills in the long run. Well, that might be true. It's a theory. And when we talk about the Common Core, we're frequently talking about the victory of theory over experience. The elements of the substance of the Common Core that are a little bit harder to talk about are the emergence of these testing consortia like SBAC and PARC that become, in effect, de facto national tests that we are um, yet to see succeed at what they promised to do. Uh, the substance of the Common Core is baffling. I have spent several years trying to comprehend it myself. I like the idea that teachers look at this thing and can find in it uh, a scope and flexibility to teach the curriculum they want to teach. Um, I have a feeling, however, that that's more rhetoric than reality. The fact is that the Common Core insistently says it is not a curriculum. Its standards, not a curriculum. Kathleen has repeated that line. If you go into Common Core material, you can hardly get through a page without seeing a repetition of it. If it's truly not a curriculum, why do you have to say it over and over and over again? The reason why you have to say it over and over again is that it looks an awful lot like a curriculum. Now, the words standards and curriculum are presented, Kathleen says, as though they are widely separated things. They're not really. It's just a continuum. The more specific your standards get, the more they look like a curriculum. The broader your curriculum gets, the more it looks like standards. This is not a, um, a thing where one is over here and one is here. There's a, a line in between the two. And this set of standards looks an awful lot like a curriculum. It looks that way to every teacher who's ever picked it up. Let me go on to process, where I want to spend most of the rest of my time. Bad process leads to bad performance. And what's bad about the process with the Common Core comes down to a fairly simple thing. Uh, I will give this first in the words of an actual Common Core proponent. The architects of the Common Core didn't trust the public's judgment 
or their own ability to sway skeptics, so they opted for stealth adoption. That's from Rick Hess, who's actually a supporter of the Common Core. Stealth adoption is what we got. The Common Core, I hear I'm going to give a history lesson, so bear with me if you can. The Common Core begins in 2007 as the brainchild of three people, David Coleman, Jason Zimba, and Susan Pimpentel. They form a partnership called Student Achievement Partners. Within a year, they hatched their idea and presented it to Gene Wilhoit in 2008. Wilhoit is the director of something called the Council of Chief State School Officers. He helped sell it to the National Governors Association that year, and by December of 2008, the National Governors Association, the Council of Chief State School Officers, and Achieve create something called Benchmarking for Success, which calls for internationally benchmark standards, we just heard that phrase, in math and language arts for grades K through 12. 2009, June, we have a new president, we have a new uh, head of the Department of Education. The National Governors Association and the Council of Chief, Chief State Officers announce in that month that 49 states and territories have joined in this enterprise. So this is a state-led thing, or so it appears. In September of 2009, the Common Core Validation Committee is created and begins reviewing drafts. And I'll pause a moment on this. 49 states have bought into this. Hey, what have they bought into? Air, nothing. It's not until several months later that a committee is formed to begin to create the standards. So you have people purchasing something that doesn't yet exist. And that's going to be the pattern of stealth that continues all the way through with this. The first incomplete draft of the Common Core was released in September 2009. Incomplete, and the public is given 30 days to review it. That's the public input that goes into the creation of the Common Core. In January 2010, we get the first results, the submission deadline for the race to the top. You may not remember exactly what happened, but let me review that. Soon after President Obama was elected, we had the Congress pass the stimulus package, had many billions to spend. It was supposed to be spent on shovel-ready projects. There really weren't very many. Secretary of Education Arne Duncan comes up with the idea, let's spend the money on the Common Core. We'll do that by creating a program called Race to the Top, in which the states can compete for hundreds of millions of subsidies to buy into the Common Core. So we have a federal incentive. Now, people who call the Common Core Obama Core, I don't, but some people do, are thinking back to that moment when what had been something launched first by a private body, then adopted by an association of state governors, suddenly becomes a national program. That happens through the race to the top in early 2009. What happens next is that the states begin to apply for this, I'm going to condense, but only two winners are picked from the race to the top, so you have a whole lot of states, 40 of them, that join in this. Two of them get a pot of money for it. That would be Delaware and Tennessee. In 2000, June 2010, the government opens a second phase of applications for race to the top with 10 more states due to win. Those 10 states include D.C. and Florida, Jeb Bush's state, and North Carolina, Jim Hunt's state. Bush and Hunt are govern governors that were prime movers behind this. By February 2011, we get the first cracks in public review of this. A uh, bill is introduced in South Carolina calling for the Common Core not to be imposed on the state. Remember, these are voluntary state standards, so why should anybody be worried about it being imposed on the state? No sooner is this bill introduced than Secretary Arne Duncan sends a stern letter to the state saying, you can't get out, you're, you're lowering your expectations, we won't let you out. December 2011, phase three of the race to the top winners are announced. By May 2012, Achieve, the organization that is one of the three main promoters of the Common Core, 
releases its own poll showing that at that point, May 2012, what is that, five years into the development of Common Core, 79% of American voters know nothing or not much about the Common Core. So is this a popular reform, one that has been vetted through public discussion and debate? Have teachers looked at this? Has the public had a chance to review it? No, nobody has. By August 2012, a string of states begin to express their doubts about the standards. Utah withdraws from SBAC, one of the uh, uh, testing agencies. To the present, we now have eight states that have pulled out of the Common Core completely. I think that number's right. About 15 that have pulled out of the testing consortia and about a dozen others that are looking for ways out but are running into the obstacles that Arne Duncan is putting in their way. What obstacles would those be? Well, the No Child Left Behind Act required that by this year, every state would have to have 100% proficiency in the levels of math and English that were required by the law. 100% proficiency being impossible the states turn to the Department of Education for waivers to get out of this. It turns out that they don't get their waivers if they try to get out of the Common Core. So we now have a kind of extortion racket run by the federal government that presses people into staying in the Common Core. Is this a matter of state standards or is this a national curriculum imposed by force and by trickery? I think the answer to that's pretty clear. The force and trickery are definitely part of the picture. Now, that, that's as much of the history as I can work into these few moments, but let me draw the lesson from this. The Common Core originated in deception, and the deceptions run all the way through it. The claim that it's not a curriculum is a deception. The claim that it's not a national project is a deception. The claim that it's internationally benchmarked is more than a deception, it's an outright lie. There is just nothing internationally benchmarked about this thing at all, and anybody who's looked for those internationally benchmarked pieces of the standards has come up with a puff of air. It claims to make students college ready, and that's where I first got interested in this. It actually sets standards at what its own architects have said is community college level. So if you want your students at the best high schools in the country to be community college ready, we've got a national curriculum for you and it's called the Common Core. It claims to set higher standards. It doesn't. It lowers standards. Well, let me be more precise. In some states like Massachusetts, it's knocked the standards down the drain. We've seen the, the results on standardized tests dropping precipitously as Massachusetts opted out of its own rigorous standards in favor of the Common Core. My friend Jamie Gass calls it the race to the middle because you can find states in which the Common Core raise standards, but you can find other states like California, Minnesota, Massachusetts, in which it's lowered standards. Is this what we gain for having a national curriculum? Mediocrity? Is this what we should aspire for from around the country? I don't think so. Now, there are plenty of other kinds of criticisms that we could level on the Common Core. The thing is enormously expensive. It's costing our states billions of dollars. The little bits of money that came through the race to the top don't begin to cover the cost of implementing it. It has this data mining aspect in which private information on students from K-12 goes into national databases. Now, that's the one in which, once it became public, the architects of the Common Core began to squirm out of it. So maybe data mining isn't on the table anymore, but we're not really sure. One of the reasons we're not sure is that the Common Core is a private copyrighted set of standards. And states are free to change it? No, not really. You're either in it or you're out of it. Copyright says the people who own the Common Core tell you what's in it. The ability to modify it to suit local state concerns is basically a fiction. And then there's the issue of the Gates Foundation, which, as it happens, has put somewhere on the order of $300 million into this and supports, among other things, the Fordham Institute. So when the Fordham Institute does a study that says the 
standards of the Common Core are higher than those of the 50 states, I think you have to weigh that against what the Fordham Institute benefited from in stating that. And I think that's where I'll stop. Thank you. I'm gathering to proceed into an entirely different issue of trying to respond as well I can to this um, uh, presentation that Kathleen has given. Um, I've begun to do that already, but let me see if I can uh, pull this apart. Uh, Kathleen began with the distinction between standards-based reform and the Common Core, pointing out that standards-based reform is considerably older than the Common Core. Uh, point, I agree. The standards-based reform movement goes back at least 20 years before this. Um, I don't assume into place that the standards-based reform movement was a good thing for the country. Uh, it had a bipartisan aspect to it, for sure. But standards-based reform seems to have meant that we are able to discern in advance exactly what should be taught in every school in the country. The defense of standards-based reform that Kathleen has offered is that it's essentially a bulwark against racism, that we can't trust our teachers not to have what uh, former President Bush called the soft bigotry of low expectations, and that we will, without some set of rigorous standards, end up discriminating against racial and other minorities. Well, uh, that's a view of our teachers that I don't endorse. I think there are plenty of problems with our schools, and certainly with teacher preparation that need to be addressed, but if the answer to the soft bigotry of low expectations on the part of teachers is to put a straitjacket on every teacher to teach one low curriculum to everybody, it strikes me as not a very successful way to go about things. There's a problem here, in other words, which I agree is a real problem, but the solution doesn't fit the problem. We have standards that are thus based on fear that teachers won't do the right thing if we leave them free to abide by the standards set by their schools or by their states, but that they will do the right thing if they have Gates Purchase standards enforced by Arnie Duncan. Does that wash? I'm not quite sure. Um, we have the instance of Mr. Robinson who first encountered hard standards in an AP class, uh, I suppose that's AP history, but I'm not sure. But I actually, I will take just a moment to um, digress on this, but it's interesting that AP gets on the table here. Uh, not long after the Common Core got up and running, uh, David Coleman, who was its primary architect, became the head of the college board in 2012 with the promise that he would make the SATs and the AP tests align with the Common Core. The relevance of this is that while we're told that Common Core is not a national curriculum, we are now having the AP tests, which are very much a national curriculum, and the college boards, which shape the national curriculum, line to the Common Core. So it's a pretty direct evidence that this is part of a larger issue that goes beyond math and English language arts, the two original parts of the core, to all the things that are covered by AP tests. And we've now seen just in the last year the transformation of AP US history into a common core aligned monstrosity. Um, five pages of standards have been replaced with 80 pages of detailed common core-ish uh, uh, stuff that is hostile to American history as we've traditionally known it to be. So this thing is sprawling and bigger than I can even begin to describe here. Um, the standards are no silver bullet, she says. They're necessary but not sufficient. The standards sure are no silver bullet, agreed. Um, they are neither necessary nor sufficient. They, in fact, will lower the quality of education in this country. We're told that teachers are getting adjusted to the Common Core. I certainly believe that to be true. We ask teachers to teach something, most of them will, in goodwill, do their very best to teach it and try to make it work. 
They'll work around it if they have to, but they will make it work. The problem that they face is that ultimately they do have to teach to the test. They thought they might be getting out of that burden imposed on them by no child left behind, but no, through SBAC and PARC and the other standardized tests that are part of this, they're into a testing regime even more onerous than the one they thought they were escaping, which is one reason why we've had teacher rebellion in the major unions where the union leadership supports the Common Core, but the rank and file think the Common Core is bad news. Um, state standards vary state by state. There's a famous line that Bill Gates used that algebra is the same, I think he said, in, in Mississippi and Minnesota, something like that. Well, of course it is. Most knowledge is the same wherever you go, but how it gets taught, when it gets taught, vary quite a bit. Why is that such a scary thing? It's really a scary thing for a certain kind of national elitist who wants things to be standardized for the sake of standardizing them. There really is nothing wrong with variety from school to school and from state to state. Why it should be so scary to us has just baffled me. I never see the argument why it's so bad, only that once it's evoked, we know that it's instantly bad. I actually favor federalism. I think we are better off as a country in which parents and teachers can work together to make schools work in their local communities. Once we shift the power to Washington and to these faceless national entities like PARC and SBAC, we lose that. You're really dividing the people who are the basic constituency of the schools from the management of the schools themselves. Now, um, I, I tried to get these four points. I hope I got them clearly. The common core is clear, rigorous, and internationally benchmarked. That was point number one. Well. I guess it doesn't help much to say that it's not clear, it's anything but rigorous, and it certainly isn't internationally benchmarked. But you know, that takes us down to actually looking at the document, which is hard to do in a public setting like this. But I suggest if you haven't read the Common Core, try reading it and see how clear it is. As for its rigor, well, I guess that's the same exercise. Uh, second point was that it's, it emphasizes high quality literature and reading and history and science and rigor again is the watchword. Well, this has been a major point of dispute. The Common Core does recommend the use of some high quality literary texts. It does so by means of shameless excerpts. There's seldom any reading of whole books or whole books of any complexity. It, it loves the idea of treating the material you read as evidence. Uh, I've sometimes likened it as education for a kind of junior league lawyer. That is, everything that you read is evidence to be put into an argument, not material to be comprehended in its own right, appreciated as truth or falsehood, seen to lead to some poetic understanding of things, seen to lead to a historical grasp of truth. None of that. It's all evidence for framing arguments. Well, that's what the Common Core gives us. And um, I fail to see that as rigor. I see it as a kind of uh, uh, heuristic trick. The third, math st standards that prioritize, I didn't quite get this, learning for age appropriate levels. Um, well, I guess there's an argument to be made there. But if you struggled to try to comprehend how addition and subtraction are taught in first, second, and third grade, the age appropriateness of it just plainly eludes me. There are other pieces of the math education that look just plainly like dumbing down, like pushing algebra into high school so that it's no longer taught in the eighth grade, making long division wait until sixth grade. There are these pieces of math education that just look a whole lot simpler than they uh, used to be. And finally, on that, there is the, the words of uh, Jason Zimba, the mathematician who worked with um, David Coleman back in 2007, and they co-published their concept paper on this, where their idea was that mathematics instruction should be made higher and simpler, but then they redefined the word higher in one of the cutest rhetorical tricks I've ever seen as meaning higher rates of passage 
How do you get higher rates of passage? By lowering standards. So we will call the lowering of standards raising standards, and everyone will be happy. Um, that was a kind of a, a shameless bit of self-promotion on their part, but the astonishing thing is that it sold. That's, that's what the National Governors Association and the College of Chief State School Officers bought into, that we would lower standards and call it raising standards. And so finally, we have the states benefit from higher standards but retain local control. That's that sort of what I give with one hand, I take away with the other kind of argument that seems to me to be inseparable from all of the advocacy for the Common Core. Yes, we're going to give you the full benefit of a national curriculum. Oh, and you're completely free to do with it. Whatever you want at the local level, we won't touch anything. Well, which is it? It's not both. The Common Core is so significant, I'm trying to make out my notes here, because it's more rigorous than the standards that it, which it replaced. Um, well, in some cases it is, in some cases it isn't. I would say we ought to be as a country looking at the states that got it best, those that set the highest standards and actually achieved the, the result of getting large numbers of their students to rise up to those standards. The Common Core is a floor, not a ceiling. It's another line that frequently occurs in promotional material. And the answer to that is that it's both a floor and a ceiling. It's a floor here with a ceiling about two inches above it. You get to this threshold of Common Core standards, and then you discover that your school is so committed to those standards that anything that would rise above them becomes very difficult. There will be schools that escape that trap. There are going to be the same schools that escape it now, wealthy suburban schools. But how will the Common Core play in inner city schools? I think it's going to be, these are the standards, and trying to reach above them is a hopeless task. I'll stop there. And now we'll hear a rebuttal from a Professor uh, Paul McGee. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so there is a lot of uh, really exciting things that I want to touch on in what Peter said. Um, it's hard to know where to begin. There's um, a number of different things. I, I want to I want to talk about the utilitarian uh, what 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 Peter described as the utilitarian nature of the of the standards. I want to talk about the substance. In fact, I can talk about the substance of the Common Core all day. It's something that is very very near and dear to my heart. I want to talk about it, uh, the Common Core as a, as state led and whether or not that has any truth to it. And and I also want to talk about this curriculum standards uh, distinction, which I, I know is, is a big part of, of Peter's argument. And, and I understand why, um, having have, seeing it being implemented and really understanding um, the difference between what a curriculum can do for you as a teacher and what standards can. So I do want to linger on that. Um, before I get into that, there are a few misrepresentations or, or what I would call sort of factual errors that I just want to correct. So one of them, so Peter said explicitly that the Common Core in math is going to replace the standard algorithms with, uh, with math theory. But just to be clear, nothing could be further from the truth. So if you look at, I believe these are the fifth grade standards I'm looking at now, fluently multiplied multi-digit whole numbers using the standard algorithm is an explicit standard, which to me is very, very clear. Um, getting to another point, it also specifically requires that all students do actually learn the standard algorithm and not math theory instead of it. Um, the Common Core does absolutely leave open that students use multiple ways, not just the standard algorithm, but the only method that is explicitly um, articulated in the Common Core is the standard algorithm, the most effective and efficient way to teach math. It's one of the reasons that I do like the Math Common Core standards, because I believe intimately that, that fluency with basic math facts is essential to success in, in later math. Um, also, I, I know you were saying that memorization is somehow antithetical to, to the Common Core, but again, in that one, fluently multiplying um, does actually imply memorizing your basic math facts. But even if the word fluently doesn't get at it, um, it does say in other, in other standards that students will know from memory addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So, so to be clear, one of the reasons that I do support it is because I do think it's actually really strong on its call for, for standard algorithms, for basic math facts, and, and for fluently memorizing those facts so that they have them. Because we know 
math is cumulative. If you don't master those early things, it's going to be very, very hard to access uh, more advanced math later. Um, just one other quick thing. I know you had mentioned AP US history is being aligned to the Common Core. I know there's some confusion about what, uh, in, in some circles, about what Common Core covers. I, and Common Core does not cover US history at all. Um, so it's just English language arts and math. So the AP US history is not um, aligned to the Common Core uh, English language arts or, or math standards. Um, though obviously under David Coleman's watch, you are right that it has been updated. Um, so the teacher opposition point, I think this is a really interesting point, and I think it's really important. We have definitely seen, particularly those of us in New York, we have seen opposition to the Common Core really heat up over the past couple of years. And I think it's really important to understand why and to really listen to what teachers are saying. And one of the things that I think is really interesting and particularly true of New York is that much of the teacher opposition, I think, is tied directly to the link that the state has made with the, with the teacher evaluation. So linking student test scores, on uh, whatever the test is, with teacher evaluations. And I understand where that opposition is coming from. I mean, I, I definitely am not a supporter of, of uh, state teacher evaluation being linked in the way it has been in New York to, to student test scores. And I understand why that, that opposition is coming from teachers, because it's, it's a really complicated issue. Um, I know, Peter, you mentioned that PARC and SBAC, PARC uh, and, and the Smart Balanced Assessment Consortium are two uh, federally funded assessment consortia that were tasked with building tests that are aligned to the Common Core ELA and math standards. You liken them to, to national tests, and certainly they are federally funded, um, but whether or not states participate in them is, is purely optional. New York's Common Core test is, is neither park nor smart or balanced. Park will be coming out with its test next year, and, and New York hasn't decided yet if it's going to use them in part because it has already rolled out its own, has, as have a number of other states. Um, just uh, two last points. Um, yeah, you mentioned that the Common Core uh, basically calls, is somehow against reading whole books in, in literature, but I don't know of a single prohibition in the Common Core against reading um, excerpts over whole books. Um, and, and that would be a curriculum decision, uh, which is probably part of the reason that the standards are silent on that issue. Um, and I, I mean, I know people that are really masterfully implementing the Common Core, particularly at the middle and high school levels, using wonderful, rich literature and novels, and I think doing a really, really good job with it. Um, and then uh, you mentioned that, that Jason Zimbo once made a quote that when he was saying higher standards, he, was, he actually meant higher rates of passage, would actually meant, which actually required lowering standards. Again, I feel like anybody in New York would see that we don't have higher rates of passage on a common core aligned assessment. So even if he was claiming that, I think it seems clear that that's not what's happening. I mean, the, the test scores in, in any state that has shifted to a common core aligned test, one of the controversies has been that the passing rates have dropped pretty precipitously. Um, so those are just a few quick things that I wanted to, to touch on but not spend too much time on. But to get to the issue, and I agree with you, I mean, I, I, the idea that you would somehow boil education down to something utilitarian, I, I understand why that would feel, um, that would feel somehow wrong, particularly as a, as a Catholic school educator right now. I mean, we, we talk about in the, in the Catholic community about how education is about so much more than material gain. And again, I think that these English standards and these math standards are not at all at odds with teaching the rich character, and in our case, faith, and in other places it wouldn't be faith specifically, but character and history and science. Uh, there's nothing limiting about these standards. I understand that the, the rhetoric around college and career readiness can, can make it feel like that, but I think one of the reasons that I think a lot of teachers who are implementing, not all teachers, to be clear, but a lot of teachers who are implementing the standards in the classroom don't feel that utilitarian nature is because they see on the ground level with what the standards are actually asking how much further they can they can push beyond something so utilitarian so i agree i mean maybe that's a, that was an unfortunate uh, uh positioning or, or pitching and obviously uh it really resonates with with a lot of people but i think even within the catholic community we, we agree we want more than just college and career readiness we're, we're looking for for much more in our education um, 
the, the substance of the standards, I mean, again, we, we talked a little bit, or I talked a little bit about, um, about math and, and memorization of the standard algorithm, but I also think on the English language arts side, what, as, I, as I mentioned briefly at the beginning, one of the things that I was really, that I have been really supportive of is that the Common Core has made the explicit link between content and literacy. Um, and that is something that I think was missing from virtually all state standards before the Common Core, and it's something that I think holds so much promise on the substantive level for Common Core implementation. We have seen in the standards era, so much literacy instruction has come down to teaching skills that are somehow isolated from rich content and vocabulary and rich literature. Um, and, I, and I love that Common Core brings it back and, and says, we're not going to tell you what that content-rich curriculum should be, but in order for students to really understand and analyze difficult texts as they get older, they're going to have to be exposed to that content and to that vocabulary as part of, the, as part of your Common Core curriculum and as part of implementation of the standards. And for our schools, that's something that we've really embraced, and, and it's, it's really doing amazing things for our kids. We've adopted a curriculum that is, is very, very content-rich, and it's so exciting. I mean, I, so many of our students come with uh, language and vocabulary gaps um, for lots of reasons. Many of them are English language learners. Many of them are, um, are disadvantaged. And the, the, the content that comes through in that curriculum, it energizes them, it animates them, and it's amazing how quickly you can see them absorbing that vocabulary and how much that's helping their <coughs> comprehension. Um, so from a substantive level, I think that the fact that it calls for the content rich but allows local schools and communities to decide what that content-rich curriculum should be that is guiding teaching and learning, what those books are that you want to read, that gets to be your decision. Um, I, it, that combination of things, the, the freedom and flexibility to choose what you think best meets your needs and your students' needs, but also making the link explicit between content and vocabulary and reading comprehension, I think is, is really energizing, I think it's really important, um, and I think, I think we're seeing some really uh, clear evidence that it's working for our students. Um, the state-led, I mean, this is an interesting debate, and I know it's, it's one of the reasons that, um, that the Common Core has become such a firestorm in the, in the political arena. Are, is Common Core state-led? Does the fact that Common Core was incentivized by Race to the Top, does that mean that this is a federal takeover of K-12 curriculum across the country? Obviously, we're going to agree to disagree here. I, I don't think it does for a couple of key reasons. I'm glad, Peter, that you don't use the word Obama Core, but I know a lot of, I, I agree, a lot of people do. But I, I think that's actually a really interesting thing to linger on for a minute. So Obama Core is a play on Obamacare, obviously. But the key difference between the Common Core and Obamacare is that to repeal Obamacare would require the federal government doing something. To repeal the Common Core requires state governments doing something. You'd need to have 50 different states because they still control the standard setting in their states. They're the ones that have to be in charge of deciding what are the, what are the standards that guide teaching and learning in their classrooms. And I think that distinction is, is really critical. Um, I also think, I know you, you mentioned, Peter, that uh, states can't change the Common Core. They are beholden to it and they need to, to buy into it hook, line, hook, line, and sinker. Um, they, I think folks in, in places like Florida and, and Indiana and Massachusetts would be surprised by that because they have made changes to the Common Core and adopted them. And I actually want to talk about Massachusetts in particular because I think it's a really I mean, I wish there was more debate, and I'm, this is partially because I'm in the lead standards wonk, and so I get animated, as you can probably tell by the details of standards. So I wish there was more debate about uh, the substance of standards. There rarely is. Um, it was really interesting, actually. I, I believe that in the last round of Massachusetts state standards revisions, they got fewer than 10 comments during their public comment period. Just by contrast, the Common Core got more than 10,000. So it's not that there was nobody weighing in. I agree. I always wish it could be more because I do believe that this is a critical issue for our schools and for our states. Um, but the problem is there's rarely that kind of animated public debate that we see. But Massachusetts was actually an exception, and that's why I wanted to linger there for a moment. Um, Massachusetts, when the Common Core was being adopted, had a much more difficult decision than most states. 
Massachusetts is widely considered to have among the best standards in the country, and they had for more than a decade. They were really strong. And so do we scrap our Massachusetts standards and adopt the Common Core? That was actually a really hard decision for them. And I think the State Board of Education in Massachusetts took it seriously. So rather than just adopt the Common Core without any investigation or without any comparison, what they did was they pulled a committee together of educators, of university professors, and they had the, that committee do a side-by-side -side comparison between the, they had a public comment period. They also had them do a side-by-side -side comparison between the Common Core and the existing Massachusetts framework. And that committee unanimously voted to adopt the Common Core, but with several strategic changes. They said, look, we have pre-K standards and we don't want to lose those, for instance. They had some specific standards within reading and math that they said, you know what, the Common Core doesn't have these, we really want to add these in here. And so the State Board of Education took the committee's recommendation, they adopted the Common Core, but with every single change that the committee had recommended. So the Common Core in Massachusetts actually looks different than the Common Core in many other states. And then after Common Core did become the, the as I said, political hot potato that it is today, other states started to follow suit, and, and Florida is one example. They reopened a public comment period even after the standards were adopted, and they got thousands, I actually don't remember the number of, of comments they got, but they got thousands of comments and recommendations, and they made a number of strategic changes to the, what I, I believe what they now call the Sunshine State Standards. So Common Core is still uh, largely at the base of it, but there have been many, many changes, additions, and tweaks to it. So it's actually not the case that you can't change the Common Core. Several states have, um, and I, I don't know. I don't know why. Uh, the, I don't know why anybody copyrighted the Common Core. I can't answer that question. But that copyright has had no impact on states' ability to to make the Common Core their own, as, as we've seen in just those two states I mentioned. But there have been there have been a couple of others. Um, the other thing I just think is funny. I think Rick Hess would be surprised to, to be described as a Common Core supporter, which I just think is funny. I think he is. Uh, he's somebody that I, I think has a picked up position, and I know he has described it as 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 stealth. Again, I, I mean, I wasn't part of whatever backroom conversations were there, so I don't know exactly what that's referring to. But again, the it is very, very difficult to get public comment. There was actually, there were calls for public comment periods on the Common Core during the first draft in September and the second draft in March, and, the, and then the final draft within the states as they were considering adoption. Um, it's, again, it, as we saw in Massachusetts where fewer than 10 people commented, it's very, very difficult to generate that kind of uh, debate around state standards. And we've actually seen that with the Next Generation Science Standards, which, which are another one that I'm, not as enthusiastic by the next generation science standards are a set of common science standards, um, which I do actually think are a step back from many state standards. Um, but they are being adopted without any fanfare at all. I've been to public hearings where it's me and four other people and, and nobody else. So it, it is, uh, if that's, I don't, if it's self, it is definitely not deliberate. Uh, and I am very glad. I think one of the most positive consequences of this entire Common Core debate is that there is more focus and attention on state standards, and I think there should be, so I think that's a good thing. Um, the last thing that I'll just talk about is, is the whole idea of curriculum and standards. And on some level, I don't want to dive into the weeds of a semantic argument. I, the way I define curriculum and standards, they're very, very different. Curriculum is what you can actually use to drive your planning and instruction every day. You cannot use the Common Core and any state standards that I've seen to drive daily instruction. You need, you need to either have to build your own curriculum that would allow you to pull together the content, to pull together the books, to pull together everything that it is you'd be teaching. You would have to pull that together yourself or you'd have to get a program or a curriculum to do that. I think that distinction is really important. I don't think it's merely rhetorical. Um, and I think it is important to the whole idea of whether or not um, you know, this is, is taking power, somehow taking power away from localities. And again, there are many, many different uh, com supposedly Common Core aligned materials. Some are more so, some are less so. And ev again, local schools and districts have the autonomy and they have the authority to make those decisions for themselves. And that's to be clear, as I think it should be. Um, for us in our schools, we would never want to turn over control of our curriculum to somebody else. We are very happy to be in the driver's seat on that. Um, but I do think that's very, very different from, from standard setting. So I hope I did justice to <laughs> Final rebuttal statement? Would you get a... Well, um, it wasn't 
planning on a rebuttal statement, but let me add a few details. Um, in Massachusetts, since the Common Core has come in, SAT scores have dropped an average of 20 points. Uh, third grade reading scores, which are the best predictor of academic success, are also down. Uh, Massachusetts third graders scored proficient or advanced on the state tests, fell to their lowest level since 2009. And third graders reading level is back to where it was before 2002. Uh, we are seeing with the Common Core plummeting of academic standards in a state that had been successful. Governor Deval Patrick, uh, who led the move, got the right kind of people on a committee to give himself political cover for trashing a set of high academic standards and replacing them with a low set of academic standards. That's what the Common Core is. As to the issue that when a new test is given in a state like New York, everybody knows that the phasing period is going to see plummeting scores. The real question is, what are those scores going to look like after a period, the shakedown cruise is over? And I think what we're going to see there is a kind of grade inflation. That's what the Common Core promises. I think when Jason Zimba uh, promised it in 2007, along with uh, David Coleman, he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, sure, the short-term results are one thing, but look for the long-term results for another. Um, anyway, I, I think there's probably a lot of things we could go back and forth on, but it's probably better that this be an occasion for exchange. Well, sure, now that you've given me the opportunity. Okay, so the, the, the last thing. Um, it's on. Okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> so I, the fact that you're crediting Massachusetts. Yeah. What's up? I'm pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, so you're, you're crediting Massachusetts standards point drops with the Common Core, sort of blaming the Common Core for those point drops. So just to be clear, for how many years has Massachusetts been in full implementation of those standards that we feel confident making a causal link between standards, um, between the, the point drop that we've seen over the past four years um, since the adoption of the Common Core and, and the point drop? Because I believe that this past school year is their first year of full implementation. So I think, I think that's premature to make that link. Um, but if we're willing to make that link, I assume you'd be equally willing to credit DC's and Tennessee's historic gains with the adoption of the Common Core. Because that would be fantastic. I have to tell you, isn't it a pleasure listening to two brilliant people Okay, we have some questions that have been submitted uh, beforehand. I'd like to read through these, and then if time permits, we'll open it up uh, for questions from the audience. First question. As a private school principal, our implementation is more gradual, simply because we do not have the funds to go with a complete curriculum overhaul, overall. My question for the panel is, what happens to Common Core if the new president in 2016 has other ideas? Well, um, the President's influence over the Common Core uh, is, as I've just pointed out, limited in that uh, the federal government's role in this has been primarily through funding and through regulatory thuggery. Uh, I assume the President could put an end to the regulatory thuggery. This is the issue that once you're in the Common Core, you can't get out without paying a big price. Uh, the uh, notion that you can uh, have state autonomy by putting suntan oil over the Common Core and calling it sunshine standards instead of Common Core uh, is a fiction that would probably disappear under those circumstances. Uh, there's lots of efforts now of states to rebrand the Common Core by some local name in order to escape the uh, populist cure that's against the Common Core. But people aren't that stupid. They know that if you take the Common Core and put a new label on it, it's the same old thing. I think presidential leadership would call for an end to that kind of trickery. Uh, of course, it would depend on which president was uh, in charge, and that's an unknowable as far as I can see. I guess I would 
the only thing I would add, I, I agree with Peter that the president's influence over Common Core, over state standards, is that states still uh, adopt and set their own standards for K-12 uh, education. Um, and the question of whether or not the states would pay a pri high price for opting out of the Common Core, there is currently um, no annual funded and annual federal funding that is tied to Common Core adoption. So states could adopt an entire, if states wanted to, if Tennessee decided tomorrow they wanted to adopt the Massachusetts prior curriculum framework as its own or their old standards as its own, they wouldn't lose any recurring annual funding for that. <laughs> I, I'm skeptical of that. The, there's no funding that is tied to the Common Core explicitly. <laughs> but the Department of Education controls enormous amounts of money that flow back to the states. Roughly 10% of the school budgets in this country come through federal funding. And there, there is a cross-lacing of that funding with whatever the priorities of the administration might be. So there's plenty of dollars that would disappear from a state that got crosswise with the Common Core, and we've already seen it happen. By that admission, though, as well, I think there, that you run the risk of if a, um, so what you're saying then is that if a president is hostile to the Common Core, they could do exactly the opposite then, too. I mean, really, uh, in, a, in a pickle then, and, and the states still set their, their, their state standards. I think at this point in this political climate, any president who came in and tried to exert that level of influence over state standards um, would find themselves wildly unpopular. I think we can agree on either side of the aisle. <laughs> For a rare moment of complete agreement, <laughs> uh, that that is the case. Uh, we, <laughs> we would, uh, I think, probably both want a uh, an approach to presidential leadership on this that acted with considerable deference to what the states would want, and those states that are in love with the Common Core, God bless them. Thank you. Okay, second. Why are you having so much trouble with my mic? I blame Bill Pitt. Okay. Okay, second question. I am a single mom with three children, and I've always tried to help my kids with their homework. Now, with Common Core, I have no clue how to help with their new math. What can I do? Any suggestions? And money is tight, so tutors are out. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I understand that this is, there are lots of um, problems that have been shared online. I remember Louis C.K., the comedian, um, launched the tweet heard around the world, I think a year and a half ago now, where he ranted about a, a problem that, uh, a math problem that one of his children got uh, that apparently was a common core math problem. Um, and I read some of the problems and, and I, I understand the confusion. To be clear, a couple of things. Um, the existence of poorly crafted uh, curricular materials or problems predates the Common Core. It's a real serious issue. I'm not actually underscoring it. My, my children right now actually have our, um, they work from a math book that was published before the Common Core. And I regularly am reading word problems that they're doing that make absolutely no sense to me. Um, I, I wish I had something so easy to blame that on, and I, and I wish it was as easy as, as saying if we got rid of standards, we would solve our curriculum problem. That's not the case. One of the things that I that I'm ha one of the, the benefits of commonness. I haven't talked very much about commonness of the common core, in part because to me it's not nearly as important as the substance of the standards. But an ancillary benefit of, of the commonness, whether it's among seven states or 40, is that there's a greater marketplace for curricular materials. So they, their shared standards allows for a greater marketplace. And we've seen some really nimble, smaller publishers getting much, much more attention um, uh, than, than they had in the past. In the past, the big textbook giants really ran roughshod over all the smaller groups. And now we're seeing a marketplace that allows for a lot more innovation. And my hope is that some of the, that will help weed out some of what I agree are very, very poorly crafted um, math curricula, some of which are Common Core aligned, some of which predate the Common Core. But I'm hoping a greater marketplace will help solve that. I agree completely as a parent and as an educator that uh, there's nothing more frustrating than getting something and genuinely not understanding it and not being able to, to, help, uh, to help your student or your child access. <coughs> Maybe. I can repeat the C.K. Lewis, uh, the Lewis C.K. joke. 
Bill has three goldfish, he buys two more. How many dogs are there in London? <laughs> the, uh, the answer to the question, I think, probably comes down to teach your children the math that you know how to teach them. It's not going to hurt them to learn math another way. The common core math is an elaboration of number line theory. And it makes sense if you teach it to yourself. You're not doing your children any favor by helping them learn something that's dysfunctional in the first place. And we're just going to have to wait until the people who created the common core math standards wake up and realize that this thing is a dead end. At least that part of it. The rest of the common core might be wonderful, but that's really bad. Um, there is a... Uh, I'll solve that. Okay, next question. My husband and I own a plumbing business and our son will join the business full-time when he graduates, if he graduates from high school. We have been warned by his counselor that he may not graduate because he is not a good test taker. This is a significant blow to his self-esteem. Not everyone should go to college. How about more training programs for students with an interest and talent in mechanics? Yes, great idea. <laughs> yeah, I agree completely. Um, and that's why I think it's really positive that states and districts set degree requirements. I think absolutely it makes sense. We should have many, many more options. There's no one path, for, one degree path for, for every student. Thank you. But how can you get away with that? The Common Core teaches that there is one path. It's called being college and career ready. And there it is. Yeah, I mean, not if you're going into a technical field rather than heading off to college. There are degree differences, certainly. Where in the Common Core exists this alternative path? Uh, the Common Core doesn't address standards for other pathways. Sure, they address standards for college level in which language arts and math. Right. So your so would-be plumber gets the same thing that your would-be astrophysicist. But the Common Core does not decide what courses are offered in high schools across the country, what degrees are offered to students across the country. All of that is set locally. It's set locally as long as those schools meet the Common Core standards, which, as you have portrayed them, are so rigorous that the schools have to do that. They're going to do that and then branch off on the side and do all these other things, like prepare students for careers as plumbers and electricians. I don't see it. I, mean, I think we've seen lots of schools have technical pathways for um, you know, vocational technical schools. And, and, and so I, I'm, and maybe I'm not actually following like why you wouldn't be able to take other courses beyond English and math. The Common Core does not reduce all of instruction in all K-12 education and subjects. No, but it insists that every other subject be aligned to those standards. No, it doesn't. ELA is supposed to hit every subject, right? No. No? It's not. Read it. <laughs> You've said yourself that it's there in the history classes. It's there in all the other classes. I, I, I think we have a comment from somebody in the front row. Yes. I'm a parent in Brooklyn, and I happen to be a data privacy and copyright attorney. Uh, but my main question is this. If you agree, uh, both professors, if you agree that there is a problem with the achievement gap, meaning, in, in, and that's a shorthand term for the fact that poor children in this country don't seem to have the same educational opportunities and, and ultimately career opportunities as those that come from more privileged backgrounds. If you disagree that the Common Core is the way to go, what do you see as the most promising alternatives to that? Thank you. Thank you. I guess that question is directed mainly to me, since uh, <laughs> Kathleen has uh, her alternative. The answer is not going to be a very satisfying one. We need to have schools in which parents are actively concerned with what their children learn. Well, one of the reasons that we have the achievement gap has to do with the breakdown of the family in America. So we're dealing with a very complex social pathology that's going to take a long, long time to fix. Uh, but 
we have to concentrate the efforts where the problem is. And the problem is that in families that are checked out from the welfare of their children, you have to work around that and find ways to reach those children in school that, that don't depend so much on the family, but which rebuild the family where we can. Are you, are you endorsing the achievement zone type of a, uh, school where the whole community gets involved? Yes. I have been a teacher for 25 years and I believe we need standards, absolutely. Do you believe individual states should establish their own standards or do you agree that one size does fit all? Well, I, yeah. I kind of think we've covered that one, right? Okay. We're all out of common core in my judgment. This is from a school principal who was too quick. One year we didn't have it, the next year we did. Gradual implementation would have been preferred. So different, yeah. Different states rolled out common core differently. I know in New York here, there was the sort of rip the band-aid off approach. In Tennessee, it was far more gradual. Um, I think there, uh, there are a lot of good reasons to do it more gradually. I think there are a lot of um, probably more provocative reasons to, to take the rip the bandit off approach. Um, I think that, um, yeah, I, I think it probably from a teacher's perspective, um, having some kind of finite but gradual rollout of Common Core makes some sense. I mean, I think there is some, some logic to saying yesterday you didn't have Common Core aligned materials, today you do, and now you have to be held accountable to them. I think that's tough. I think it was particularly tough in New York because of the length of teacher evaluation as well. Um, so different states did it differently. I, I think there is some logic to find finding a greater balance between an evolution that takes, you know, goes on at the infinitum and a rip the bandit. I think probably a middle ground is, is more sound. Thank you. You know, the states are our laboratory, and if we're in a true federal system, we should have let one or two states try this out and see if it worked, find out where the rubs are. And if it works there, then expand it. But to try to take it nationally, even if there's some staggering from state to state, it's just the wrong approach. Thank you. Uh, last question for me, and then we'll open. Yes, sir. Where can I get a copy for myself so I can read the uh, Common Core? Okay. I hear the term used very frequently, and I don't know exactly what it is. I'd like to be able to read these standards. If in math okay and absolutely on. fair point if you would at the end of tonight just give me your name and uh you know we'll get that for you okay Thank you. you're welcome yeah. last question for me and then we'll open it up for questions from you i am presently student teaching and feel as though my own individuality and creativity are compromised by the common core virtually i'm told what to say and when to say it uh, should i be evaluated strictly on how my students perform on tests I think, uh, no. Um, I, I, mean, I think that linking student test scores, especially from the state level, to, to teacher evaluations, um, I, I, I don't support. Um, so, yeah, no. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what I think about that. I think that as long as we've got common core, uh, we might as well see how it plays out in its own terms. So maybe you should be evaluated on the basis of uh, how this stuff works. Are we going to let the common core advocates pick and choose which pieces of it they're going to emphasize? I don't know. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Yes. I just have a quick question. Um, as a education major, adolescent, and a history concentration, why history is on the file to the common core? You didn't, like you said that it wasn't. Right. I'm just wondering why ELA is math, not uh, history. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I, I think there's probably. They chose to, the, when they were, when the authors and when the, the CCSSO and NGA came together, they decided to create standards for English language arts and math. Quite frankly, I, I, I bet you that part of the reason is that setting common standards for either history or science is, is far, far more difficult, particularly history. If you want to talk about a political hot potato, I mean, I think we, we saw what happened, what is it, 90, when, when states tried to. So I think it just politically would have been completely untenable. 
Right. Well, we disagree on on the extent to which the Common Core is going to limit itself to ELA and MAT. Officially, that's what it's limited to. But the ambitions of David Coleman and many of the supporters of the Common Core go way, way beyond those, those two areas. Uh, I think that the uh, revision of the advanced placement US history tests uh, and soon to be followed, they're being rolled out now, the AP civics tests, the AP European history, there's 60 some uh, advanced placement uh, areas which the college board has direct control over. Um, those go to oftentimes the best teachers in the high schools, they teach other classes. So when you change AP tests and scores and standards, you are in effect changing everything. And it's all being done in the name of being common core aligned. Now, uh, when I used that phrase before, I didn't say exactly what it means, but partly it goes back to that idea that uh, at the heart of the English language arts is the idea that you're reading material to treat it as evidence in arguments. And that's the way history is being recast now as well. You don't learn history as a coherent subject. You learn it for the purposes of argumentation. And, and the way in which the new AP history standards are set out uh, mirrors almost word for word the way uh, ELA says reading should be taught. So these things are fusing together. Uh, if that's what you want to see happen, uh, take heart, it's happening. I think it's a bad thing. Any other questions? Yes. OK. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, I wish I could take both of you and put them, put some of yours <laughs> and some of yours together. Uh, I think uh, some of us remember when there was a push to bring back the vocational schools and Mayor Bloomberg said, well, that will mean that some of those students will be taking fewer regents exams. So, you know, so what? Uh, as far as the, the math, those that don't learn the, the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. I remember my parents couldn't help me with the new math in 1960. And I can't, I can't see that th why this is happening all over again, where if you're trying to get cohesive family units, you're making it impossible. Now, I agree with Peter on a lot of the off-the-track things, but I also agree, Kathleen, I may be confusing standards with accountability. When you're bringing in these things, we have gone away from them in the 90s because you will be hurting the student's esteem. They have to express themselves, but they're not held accountable for grammar. And I am so fortunate that I am retired, but I'm hearing, you know, you can't even use the red pen anymore. Any other questions, comments? Yes? If you're in a small system, nest of money is limited. If you buy math books all the time, that's all you're doing. Every time you change the way we teach mathematics, the school buys 400 new math books. And the rest of us who are not teaching mathematics are using books that are 10, 12, 15 years old. It's just not right to continually change. We move geometry back in, so we bought all geometry books. Now we're going to move it out again because the core curriculum is going to be different, so we're going to throw all of those books out or put them in the attic for when it turns around again and, and buy new books. And that's all we focus on. And history and science gets left in the dust. It's just not fair. And, and also working at St. Peter's, you're on a limited budget, Very right? limited. Okay. Very limited. Any other comments or questions? Okay, how about a round of applause for two